moving poleward to track suitable climate as conditions warm, and moving up slope. So, um, this is to indicate, is to look at species individualistic response. So remember we said that species won't always move together, they'll move in a unique, in a way that's unique to that individual species. Now here we do have the time slices labeled, thank goodness. And so we've got the first one at about 20,000 years ago, and then moving to the modern period. So this is looking at just three species and possible combinations of them, okay? So you don't have to sort of zoom in on the individual colors. The important point here is that the different colors represent different combinations of spruce and sedge and birch, okay? And you'll notice that if you look at the colors of 20,000 years ago, they're quite different than the modern colors. And you don't see many of these colors from 20,000 years ago here in the modern landscape. And what that tells you is that the combinations of these three species 20,000 years ago were quite different than the combinations that we see today. And you can track that through. You can see here's one that's fairly uncommon 20,000 years ago, it gets much more common and then disappears again. So it sort of grows and then contracts. Some of these purple ones are appearing, so those are novel associations or novel communities coming into the landscape. Um, and this orange one, I think, is disappearing. You know, it's here, it's here. By the time you're 10,000 years ago, that orange association, whatever that is, orange is sort of spruce and sedge found together. So spruce and sedge are found together 20,000 years ago, but from 10, 11,000 years ago to now, they're not really found together very much. Maybe up here, can't tell which color that is. But you definitely see that in space, uh, the associations of individual species with one another changes a lot and we get new combinations appearing as climate changes and some of the old combinations disappear. So that's the novel and disappearing ecosystems concept that we talked about. Okay, any questions there? Can we build a small fire, please? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> jacket is back in the room, <laughs> so uh, we won't go into why Lee forgot his jacket, you know, absent-minded professor prerogative, I'm allowed to do that. Um, okay, so we've talked about species moving northward and upslope, we've talked about species moving in different ways so they occur with n new combinations of species and the, the species they occur with in one time period may not carry through to the next time period. Okay, and this is really the same thing, so I won't do this one, I think, as another combination of colors uh, to emphasize what are called no analog communities, which mean a no analog community is a community um, that's uh, n not currently found anywhere in modern vegetation. So it's something that existed in the past that there's n no analog for in the current uh, climate. So without worrying about this, these particular set of colors, uh, this spruce sedge combination, the orange one that disappears, is a no analog uh, community because there's no modern co-occurrence of spruce and sedge. Uh, so those are important terms in paleoecology. And this one's a little hard to follow, but the basic story here is the same thing applies in the marine realm. So this figure shows a gray area where a certain number of species, all the species that are represented in the open or closed circles presently co-occur and the dots show where they co-occurred during the glacial period. So these species, these, some species have moved northward, some species have moved southward, and um, formerly they co-occurred. So we also see species moving individualistically in the marine realm, and as a result we have no analog communities and novel and disappearing ecosystems in marine 
uh, situations as well. Um, for the tropics, the tropics are not left out. Th the tropics are much less well understood than temperate environments, partly because there are more researchers in temperate countries, uh, but also because there are fewer lakes that have suitable st stratification or annual layering in the tropics. And part of the reason for that is that there aren't strong seasons in the tropics, so you don't get a big flush of material that gives you a clear layer in your mud or your sediment that you can track. But Mark Bush was there in that lake in the Andes dropping a core down in the mud because that lake did have annual uh, layering and he's able to read it and uh, tropical ecologists are increasingly finding lakes that let them uh, answer similar questions about the tropics. But the pattern is the same really. Spe and especially in tropical mountains, species are moving up slope. Um, it's a little harder to track latitudinal changes in the tropics because the tropics are already warm and we don't have a lot of lake records in the tropics. But in the places that we do know, it's pretty clear that um, tropical species are moving up slope as conditions warm. So here's time again on the horizontal axis. This is about 30,000 years ago. And beginning at about 20,000 years ago, as we move out of the glacial period, you see these vegetation zones moving up slope. So now we've said that vegetation associations don't move in, in lockstep with the, all the species moving together. But all the same, there are still um, some generalizations we can make about vegetation uh, moving up slope. So if you just wanted to look at tree line, for instance, in this tropical mountain in Borneo, you would see the tree line moves up very strongly from about 15 to 10,000 years ago and then settles down. So the same sorts of changes are happening in the tropics. There are important differences about tropical changes, but in terms of broad principles, the, the principle of species moving upslope to track warming climates holds. Yeah, sorry? The graph above and below, are they the same? Above and below. You mean these? Yeah. yeah, so these different bands represent different vegetation transitions, essentially. So, um, not sure which is which, but say this one is tree line, and then this one is a tr transition from um, pre-montane to montane forest, and, and montane to lowland forest. So those are different bands that are... Brown? Uh, brown, brown is the lowland to lower montane forest boundary. Mm -hmm. So this, this one? Yes. Yeah, that, so that's the boundary between uh, the lower montane and lowland forest boundary. And so you see it's moving up, but it's not moving up as much as tree line is, or the alpine f to upper montane forest transition is moving uh, a lot farther up and down than is this lower montane forest boundary. So, and that's consistent with species moving in individualistic ways. So we don't expect everything to just move up as uniform layer cake up the mountain. We expect some zones to expand and some to contract because species and ecosystems are responding in, uh, in individualistic ways. Okay. Um, just a couple of more points here. One of which is that recently, paleoecologists have come to realize that the way they were looking at pollen records derived from lakes may not tell them the whole story of how plants respond to climate change. And in particular, and this is especially important in temperate climates, so we won't dwell on it, but um, Paleoecologists have been puzzled for a long time about how trees were able to recolonize after the ice sheets retreated in the northern hemisphere because the ice sheets retreated over uh, tens and hundreds of kilometers and it seemed difficult to see how trees were going to be able to keep pace with that with across those distances given their seed dispersal distances which might not be very great so there's a, a complex story to be told there, but one part of that story is that paleoecologists had been assuming 
that when they had low amounts of pollen in a lake, that it meant that that was long distance wind blown pollen and it didn't mean that there were any trees in that area and they just sort of subtracted that out and said, well, if we just have a trace of pollen, we're gonna figure that came in from somewhere else and it doesn't count. Uh, and that's why you see here in the pollen record, for instance, for this uh, oak, that the pollen record shows that there are no trees up near the ice sheet. And for a long time, people thought that was the case, that there were just no trees near the ice sheet in the northern hemisphere. But if you look at the pollen, uh, the fossil record rather, you can see that there actually are fossil occurrences of uh, trees quite near the ice sheet. So the, the paleoecologists were wrong for quite a while in assuming that small amounts of pollen meant that there weren't any trees near the ice sheets. There were trees near the ice sheets, and that's one of the explanations for how trees could move so quickly once the, the uh, interglacial began and the ice sheets retreated. Do we have a question? Questions? Anybody? No? Okay. So is that what, is that what would be called micro-refugia? Yeah, so that's what people think about in terms of micro-refugia near the ice sheet uh, as the glacial period ended. And people are increasingly thinking that some of these small pockets of vegetation may be very important in other settings as well. So even in the tropics, it may be very important if there's a small pocket of vegetation that's gonna find its suitable climate expanding. And that's kind of what we looked at around the Cedarberg, right? We saw some small pockets of some of those proteus species near the Cedarberg, and then as climate warmed, they expanded. And that's exactly the micro cl climate uh, argument that people are making, is that small pockets of microclimate caused by topography can be very important in helping species respond to climate change by providing outliers of populations, they'll be in the right place to expand when climate warms. And then the final thing to say from paleoecology, I guess, is um, I mentioned that there's some, we, we had a question about genetic adaptation to climate change, and I said, well, it's interesting that much of the evidence for genetic adaptation to climate change is in the form of species being able to move, um, move more rapidly uh, to track climate. So this is a, an example from lodgepole pine. Here's the lodgepole pine tree. Here's the cone. Here's two morphs of the seed. One has no wing at all and one has a long wing. And it turns out that you find the long winged version of the lodgepole pine in places where it's recently colonized after the ice sheet retreat. So the stipularia here is lodgepole pine with long-winged morphed seeds, and it tends to occur in places where the, the tree has been tracking climate change and climate has been changing quite rapidly. So as the tree is ex experiencing climate change, the long-winged morph of the seed is selected and you see more long-winged seeds in these areas that are recently colonized after uh, glacial retreat. And you see the similar things in long-winged morphs of uh, insects in Britain and other places. So there's quite a bit of evidence that there's genetic adaptation uh, for expression of traits that help species move quickly to track climate change. Uh, there's less evidence that species have other sorts of genetic adaptations that let them suddenly change their genetic makeup or their phenotypes to survive where they are as climate changes. Okay, so that's uh, our view of paleoecology and setting up some of the principles that we expect to apply in the future. And the next thing we wanna do is then look at some current changes and a little bit of how we'd model into the future. But why don't we take a short break if people wanna move around. Lee can go get his fleece and uh, we'll, uh, yeah, Sissy. Yeah, yeah, there are questions if people have questions before we go. Yes, in response to climate change, I yeah. see you say some trees or species will adapt, some will move or die. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a chance for species to evolve into other species, like chance for speciation? Right, so that's what we were talking about in terms of the question was, are there, 
chances for species to evolve into different species uh, so that they're able to stay where they are. Well, they, they, the, at first, I think they wouldn't have to evolve into different species. They just have to have their genetic makeup change so that their climatic tolerances would change. Um, and there's not really much evidence of that ever happening in the past through all sorts of climatic changes. So the chances of that happening seem cl quite slim, but we are going to be putting species into situations where they can't move across natural landscapes anymore. And so we might see a few <coughs> population bottlenecks re result in unusual genetic outcomes. We, we, you know, that possibility is there, but most of the evidence indicates that, peop that species have moved to track suitable climate rather than undergoing any sort of uh, genetic adaptations. <laughs>